Hello, and welcome to the next installment of the System C video training series from Forte Design Systems. Today's video deals with System C test bench modules. Now, last time we designed a small fur filter with the algorithm being a System C clock thread. We learned how to organize the thread as reset initializations followed by a continuous while loop containing handling of inputs and outputs and the functionality of the filter. What we need to do next is prove that our filter works. Today we're going to learn how to set up a hierarchical test environment with a top level module that instantiates our filter alongside a test bench and connects them together. We're also going to go into the guts of the test bench module and learn how to write threads that generate input stimulus for the filter and read the output values coming back from the filter. So as a reminder, here's what our filter looked like. It has a clock and reset with a single input and output port. Here's the System C module that we created with the port and thread declarations. Now I mentioned in the previous video that there's a certain file partitioning we want to maintain that will make file and project management easier when we start using Forte Synthesizer. We said that just the module and thread declarations should be in one file like you see here, while the thread definition should be in another. I'm saving this code in a file called fur.h, fur to match the module name, and the .h means header file in C and C++ convention. This will be included in the file where our clock thread definition is. Here's the other code we created with the fur main thread definition. I'm going to save this in a file called fur.cc. In C++ file extensions, .cc or .cpp are conventional. Notice again the double colon scoping operator saying that this thread belongs to a module called fur. So the way that we bring in the header file is to include it, and we do that using a pound include statement with the name of the header file in quotation marks. So with those files saved, we now have a fur module that we can drop into a test environment. Our fur module has inputs clock, reset, and INP, and output, outp. We'll instantiate it in our testbed with a reference name, fur0. To test it, we'll create a test bench module called tb, which has ports corresponding to fur. We'll instance it with the reference name, tb0. Now our fur and tb need a top-level structural host module, so we'll put them in one called system. Finally, we'll declare some signals in the system module to connect the corresponding ports. The clock ports are a little different because those are both input ports for the fur and test bench. We'll create that with a special system C clock class, and I'll show you how to do that a little later. So let's see how to do just the top-level system module with the fur and test bench instances. The code for our top-level system module needs to do the following. First, it needs to declare the fur and test bench module instances. Then it needs to declare some local signals that we'll use as wires to connect the fur and test bench ports to each other. The system module needs a constructor, and in it will go the fur and test bench module declarations and port to signal connections. Finally, it's not required, but it's a good idea to have a system module destructor, where the fur and test bench modules will be removed from the simulation stack. So let's look at how to code that. We're going to create a file called main.cc where we'll write the system module and a systemc main program function. Like we've learned already, we first need to include the systemc class library header file systemc.h. Next, we'll need to include the header files for the two modules we'll be instantiating. Now I know the tb.h header file doesn't exist yet because we haven't written it but we can still write this top-level system module because we know what the test bench module's name and port list will be. We start out declaring the module with sc underscore module in an open brace, and now we're going to learn how to declare the lower-level modules. We simply write the name of the module followed by a pointer to its reference name. And remember in C, a pointer is simply preceded with an asterisk character like this. We do that for both the test bench and fur. So back in our diagram, now that we have fur and test bench instances, we need some way to connect them. We'll start with the non-clock ports and set up signals to connect the reset, input, and output ports. Here see that signals RST SIG, INP SIG, and OUTP SIG will be used to make the connections. In the code, we're going to show you a new system C keyword, SC underscore signal. SC underscore signal is a template just like SC in or SC out. We declare each of the signals we want with SC signal and the data type of the signal in the template argument. Remember that reset was a bool type and the input and outputs were 16-bit signed integers. Then we just provide the desired signal names followed by a semicolon. 
Finally, we need to generate a clock signal to connect to the clock inputs of both module instances, and there's a very easy way to do that in System C with the SC underscore clock class. In code, you just declare a clock signal with an SC underscore clock followed by the name of the signal, which we'll just call clock underscore sig. So now that we have module instances, signals, and a clock, we can tie them all together in the system module constructor. So I'll move to a new page since there's quite a bit to show you on how to do that. Now the first thing we're going to do in the system module constructor is parameterize our clock signal. Since we declared an SC underscore clock instance called clock underscore sig, we'll use a copy constructor like this to define it. The first argument of the copy constructor is a character pointer string. This is just a textual name, so we'll provide a quoted string with the name clock underscore sig. The next two arguments define the number of units in the clock period and the actual time units. System C uses SC underscore NS for nanoseconds. If you wanted your clock period to be expressed in picoseconds, you would use SC underscore PS. This copy constructor of the clock class will generate a repetitive clock signal with a 10 nanosecond period like this. So now let's build our module instances and connect their ports to signals. To build the instances, we introduce the C++ new operator. The new operator allocates memory space for the instances. We take the module pointers and set them equal to a new module instance. Here's how you do that for the test bench and for modules. Remember that these are both SC underscore modules, so they have an argument which is a character string for its instance name. So we pass quoted strings for those names. Now we can connect each instance port to a signal. Since TB0 and FER0 are pointers, we can use the arrow style dereferencing operator to specify a particular port, then bind it to a signal with parentheses. Here we say that we are taking the clock port of instance TB0 and connecting it to the clock signal called clock underscore sig. Likewise, we do the same for the FER0 instance. So now the clock ports for the test bench and fur instances are connected to each other across the clock signal clock underscore sig. We repeat this for all the other ports and their corresponding signals. The reset ports are connected across the reset underscore sig signal and so forth. So to finish showing you the system module description, I'm going to return to a condensed version of the module and talk about the last item, the destructor. In C++, a destructor is simply described with a tilde operator followed by the name of the module, and its purpose is mainly memory housekeeping. The destructor is called when the simulation ends, and as the name implies, we simply do the opposite of what we did in the constructor. There we use the new operator to allocate memory for the fur and test bench module instances. With the simulation over, the destructor uses the C++ delete operator to take those instances away and free up the memory space. See here, we just say delete followed by the names of the instance pointers. Now there's just two other things we need to take care of in the main.cc file. We've created this top-level structural system module, but how and where do we instantiate it? Also, if you've written C or C++ programs before, you know that there's a main function required, which is where the actual execution and command argument handling is done. First, for the system module instantiation, I'm going to declare an instance pointer of it called top, and I'm going to set that pointer to null so that it's not pointing to some unknown part of memory. Then, just like C has a main function, system C has an SC underscore main function. Here's its declaration, and there's a few things I want to make sure are clear for you. First, I declare it so that it returns an integer and not a void. I do this because there are many C compilers that actually require main functions to return something. Second, you see these weird arguments for SC underscore main called argc and argv. This is how command line arguments are passed to C programs. argc means argument count and it's just an integer indicating how many arguments were on the command line when the program was run. argv means argument vector, and that's just an array of pointers to character arrays which contain the actual argument strings. We don't make use of these arguments in our example here, but later when we show you how to use synthesizer we will. The first line inside sc underscore main is an allocation of the system module, which we do with the new operator like we learned before. Next is the system c function used to start a simulation, sc underscore start. Very simple, just declare it with no arguments, and our simulation of the fur and test bench will begin. After that, there's nothing to do but end sc main, and since it returns an integer, we simply say return zero, and we're done. So the first major phase of our verification task is done. We have an SC main function and a top-level system module which instances the test bench and fur modules and connects them with signals. 
Next, we need to dive down into the TestBench module and define it. So we start with the tb.h TestBench module header file. We include the systemc header file and declare a tb module with sc underscore module. Then we define the ports like we saw in the diagram earlier. Now I do want to point out that here in the test bench, port INP is an output and port OUTP is an input, the opposite of the way they are in the FUR module. You can use any naming convention you want, but I like to give the same name to ports that will connect to each other. This makes the signal connections in the system module constructor less confusing. At this point, we need to declare the threads we will use in the TB module, and our suggestion is that you use two. Here I'm declaring a source thread, which is where the reset and INP port output values will be produced, and a sync thread, which will read the values coming back from the FUR through the OUTP input port. Keeping the source and sync portions of the test bench separate is something you'll see later is very important, especially when we start using Synthesizer and creating pipeline designs where you have to produce continuous values before anything comes back from the design. Now in the test bench constructor, all we need to do is designate that source and sync are system C clock threads, so they each get an SCC thread specification. Remember that the test bench will be producing a reset signal, so there's no checking for reset status here, like in the fur module. With the tb.h header file done, we can move on and create a tb.cc file. In this file, as we learned, we will include the tb.h header file and define the functionality of the source and sync clock threads of the test bench module. So let's create the source thread line by line. The first thing we want to do is initialize both of the outputs of this thread, reset and INP, which are the input stimulus for the fur filter. Here at time zero, we set INP to zero and we get a reset assertion by setting reset to one. To create a reset pulse, we wait one cycle, then deassert reset to zero and wait another cycle. This generates a complete reset pulse, and the fur should now be ready to accept input. I'll condense that part of the thread and move on to the generation of a series of INP values to send to the fur. I'm going to declare a temporary variable temp with the same data type as INP. We'll make assignments to temp, and then write it to port INP whenever we want to send a new value to the fur. For this simulation, I want to send a series of 64 total input values to the fur. So I set up a for loop that will iterate 64 times. Now, input stimulus creation can be done many different ways. You can read your input values from a file and send them one at a time, or you can use math to derive a sine wave with injected noise. Here I'll keep it simple and just generate a nice wide pulse. Using an if statement, I'll just say that if i is between 23 and 29, temp will have a value of 256 and otherwise temp will just be zero. Then I just write temp to output port INP and wait one cycle, and that's it. That's the entire source thread for this example. We're almost done. All that's left is the test bench sync thread to read what's coming back from the fur, so let's do that real quick. First, I'm going to declare a temporary variable called inData, which has the same data type as outP. I'll use this to read values on the outP port. Since the source thread sent 64 input values to the fur, that means if everything worked correctly, we should get 64 values back. So we'll write a for loop with 64 iterations to read the outP port. So the first line will just assign what is read on port outP to in data and wait one clock cycle. Now usually in a test bench, you'll do something like save these values being read back from the fur to a file, which you would compare to some golden results to determine whether the simulation passed or failed. We will explore how to do that in an upcoming video, but for now we'll just write these values to standard output. We'll do that with the ccout command. Cout lets you write something out to the screen while the simulation is running. You merely say cout followed by a series of variables or text strings separated by a left shift operator. So here we're saying, write out whatever the current loop index i is, followed by a colon and a tab space, and then the value of in data followed by the end of the line. Here you see that system c has a member function to int, which converts a system c data type like scint to a pure integer for printing purposes. And end l is a c language keyword that just means end of line. That's the body of the loop. So the next iteration reads the next value on the out p port and repeats. Once the loop completes, that means we've read all 64 values from the fur filter and we can end the simulation. And here we see the last systemc function we'll learn about today, sc underscore stop. 
SC underscore stop is the system C function that stops the simulation and calls the module destructors, and that's the end of the sync thread. So there you go. We've defined a complete test environment with a top-level system module pairing our fur filter with a test bench connected by signals with a generated clock signal. So let's review what we've done today. We created a test environment as a top-level structural module. We put it in a file called main.cc consisting of an scmain function which can have command arguments passed to it and has our top-level system module instance as a pointer. We also learned about the sc underscore start function which is what actually starts a system C simulation. Inside the system module, we saw how to instantiate our fur design module alongside a test bench and connect them to SC signals and a parameterized clock signal using SC underscore clock. We also saw how to use the system module constructor to allocate memory for the fur and test bench module pointers using the new operator and connect them to signals. And we learned how to use a system destructor to remove the modules and free up memory. And we finished by learning how to declare and write source and sync threads in the test bench module to generate stimulus values for simulation and read the values being returned by the fur. We hope you enjoyed this video on System C verification environments. Join us next time for final topics on running a successful System C simulation.